Hey guys, and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host. And for today's lecture, we are going to discuss the aftermath of the Mexican War. Uh, now, before we begin to discuss the aftermath of the Mexican War, uh, I just want to do a quick recap on what we discussed in our last lecture. So, our last lecture, uh, we discussed the Mexican War. We, we discussed the conclusion of the Mexican War. Um, how the issue of Texas annexation uh, sort of spurred the issue, sort of drove the United States and Mexico to loggerheads, uh, um, causing tensions to rise exponentially, and eventually resulted in open conflict, open warfare between the two nations. Um, during the war, the United States uh, went on to have a string of victories. Uh, Antonio uh, de Lopez de Santa Ana returned from exile. Uh, he was exiled after the um, after the Mexican collapse, after, well, not even the Mexican collapse, but after his own personal collapse uh, during the, uh, the Texas uh, Revolution, the Texas Revolt. Um, the uh, Lope, uh, Santa Ana came back, uh, raised the magnificent force, raised a magnificent uh, looking force, but was largely unable to derail the American forces. He lost to Zachary Taylor, he lost to Winfield Scott. Uh, Scott succeeded in taking Mexico City and ended the war. Um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was a great uh, territorial victory for the United States, uh, but it sparked a, it, was, it really just sparked a lot of internal discord back at home. Um, slave and free states divided over the issue of what was going to happen to the Mexican session, uh, the territory received from Mexico, and many believed that the war was only fought to spread slavery and indeed chattel slavery and those who proposed um, uh, initiatives that favored chattel slavery's expansion seemed to be the winner from the war. And with that said, let's dive right into our lecture. Now, the United States had acquired a very, uh, very good portion of the north of, uh, of North America with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Uh, and with the Missouri Compromise of 1820, it seemed as though the remainder of the old Louisiana Purchase country was destined to become free states. Uh, now, in, uh, in 1848, the Mexican War had delivered to the United States the rest of Western North America. Uh, the bulk of this new territory laid below the old Compromise Line. Uh, that would be 3630. The bulk of this new territory, um, which lay below it, which lay below that uh, the compromise line, uh, seemed like it would be destined uh, to be uh, the home of future slave states. Um, it seemed that those slavery would expand into these territories and would make it to the west coast. Now, the bulk of, not the bulk, I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, there were popular opinion, uh, the bulk of Southerners, I should say, uh, but, there, but, uh, but it was really just the popular opinion in the South uh, and amongst pro-slavery forces that the rest of Mexico or the remaining Spanish possessions in the Caribbean might be acquired and converted into new slave states uh, as well. Robert Toombs of Georgia warned Congress, uh, in fact, that if you seek to drive us from the territories of California and New Mexico, purchased by the common blood and treasure of the whole people and thereby attempt to fix a national degradation upon half the states of this confederacy, I am for disunion. Uh, Toombs had not take, uh, Toombs said that uh, because early on there were debates on whether or not slavery should be permitted into these new territories. Um, certainly Southerners uh, had expected slavery to uh, be allowed to expand unabated into these territories. Uh, the majority of Southerners, not all of them, um, but Toombs and his fellow pro-slavery uh, pro advocates had not taken into account the segment of the population that did not view the Mexican War with a sense of pride and accomplishment or even the segment of the population that did not view um, extending, uh, expanding slavery as something that should be done by the, uh, by the Republic. Southern Whigs, uh, like Alexander Stevens of Georgia, um, repeatedly termed uh, the Mexican War Polk's War and labeled it dishonorable, disgrace, and, and uh, disgraceful. Uh, other Whigs uh, simply questioned the ethics of one republic making war upon another republic. The most unpopular effect of the war 
uh, of the, the Mexican War was that slavery stood to make a very big political uh, gain from it. Slavery would emerge the victor, or at least uh, the proponents of slavery stood to be the victors in, in, uh, in, the, in this struggle. They, they stood to gain the most from the outcome. To the disappointment of Northerners, uh, Polk had negotiated a very timid treaty with Great Britain with regard to the border, uh, the, the bolder United States claims um, to northern to uh, the northern regions of the Louisiana Purchase and placed a geographic cap on free state expansion. Um, there were some claims that the United States uh, should uh, should receive all of basically what is uh, lower western Canada going um far beyond i think calgary i think the claim was like um i think the claim would have been that the cap of what is now british columbia all the way down like they basically wanted to uh to edge the british out um at, at uh the western borders of ontario and around uh, uh rupert's land which would be around uh uh the uh, the bay um baffin bay uh and basically take everything all the way to Alaska. Um, that that was the um, the American plan, at least. And uh, Polk put a geographic cap. He uh, made he, he ran the border um, all the way to the Pacific coast. Uh, the, he, he basically established the present um, United States Canadian border um, while aggressively seizing land from Mexico. Um, the, and, and on top of that, there was no guarantee that slave owners or their agents would not go on to destabilize other South and Central American republics to transplant, to transplant slavery to those locations and apply, has, and apply, uh, has new territory for admission to the Union at some later date. Um, the, the, the new territory, the Mexican Session, contained enough territory within itself to create enough new slave states to allow slaveholders to acquire a decisive numerical advantage in the Senate, uh, if not the, the House of Representatives as well. Now, in early 1848, four basic political positions began to take shape for administering the Mexican Session. The first proposed on August 8, 1848, was by David Wilmot, and David Wilmot was a Pennsylvania Democrat uh, who wanted to ban slavery outright from the Mexican Session. The Wilmot Proviso was essentially the old Northwest Ordinance of 1787 for a new generation of Americans. Um, equally important, uh, the, we, the, the Wilmot Proviso echoed the assertion made during the Missouri Compromise. Uh, the Andy Talmud Andy Talmage Amendment that Congress alone could decide the destiny of the federal territories. Uh, Congress broke up along sectional lines. Um, the, the Northern Whigs and all but four Northern Democrats overrode Southern votes in the House and sent the bill to the Senate, where the Southern Democrats uh, defeated it. Um, Polk was particularly disturbed by the Wilmot Proviso because Wilmot has stated earlier with the Democrat Polk with the Democrat he expected all Democrats to rally behind him uh, and that was not that was not happening now to combat this uh, Polk and his administration came up with their own solution to extend the old Missouri Compromise line the 3630 line through the Mexican session all the way to, uh, from uh, the western edges of Missouri all the way to the Pacific Coast. That was Polk's um, compromise. That, that was Polk's um, proposition. Uh, the argument rested on this. Uh, the Missouri Compromise, uh, the Missouri, uh, that line, that 3630 line, had worked for 26 years uh, from keeping the slavery issue from polarizing Congress and the rest of the nation. Uh, so extending it offered a solution that everybody had already agreed to. Uh, and President Polk was prepared to swing all the weight of his office behind this proposal. Polk, however, now began to encounter resistance from his fellow Southerners. Uh, the aged John C. Calhoun rose 
and argued that the new that the uh, territories of the United States are the property of individual member uh, of the of the individual member states, um, and that the uh, and that the states held their properties uh, as joint property. Um, and, and really, what what Calhoun meant by that statement was that uh, the citizens of the United States were entitled to enjoy the territories of the United States and entitled to carry their property into any other territories and the property that uh, that they were going to carry will be slaves and that denying and uh, and this, these the statements that Calhoun made openly denied that Congress had the authority uh, to ban the transportation of slave property into any of the territories. Uh, this was a very bold and uh, a dangerous statement uh, because Congress had asserted back in the 1780s and it had been largely accepted that Congress could uh, ban slavery from any territory, so that Congress could decide the fate of any territory. It was Congress who approved that mission to the Union. Um, it was Congress who allowed the territory to form their own governments. It was Congress that passed the Organic Acts. Um, uh, this was a very bold and a very dangerous statement. And again, this was Calhoun seeing the bigger picture. If Northerners uh, would rally in the House um, to support or uh, to support um, an anti-slavery initiative or to attack a pro-slavery initiative, there would be nothing anybody could do because they held that numerical advantage. Um, if you removed Congress from the picture and you allowed people to simply move out and to uh, go into the territories that they saw fit, then it would uh, weaken the power of Northerners, uh, or at least um, free states, and increase the power of slave states. Uh, that that was basically where where Calhoun what, what Calhoun was driving at with that. Uh, and the further compound thing, there also only two of the initiatives of uh, two of the proposals out there. Uh, the third was made in December of 1847 when Senator Lewis Cass of Michigan brought forth yet another proposal for the Mexican session, agreeing with Calhoun that Congress had no authority to settle the issue of slavery in the territories. Cass argued that the people living in the territories uh, should have the option uh, or whether to adopt uh, free or slave settlements for themselves. That is, they should decide whether they wanted to permit or not permit slavery in the territory that they lived in. Um, what he proposed became known as popular sovereignty. It eased the burden um, from Washington and the national political parties of uh, the slavery issue. It, it, that, that's what it uh, proposed to do. Uh, it appealed to the fundamental United States principle of letting citizens decide for themselves. Now Polk was no friend of Cass's and decided to go ahead with his own proposal in the summer of 1848. But Polk's proposal fails and the only outcome was that Oregon was organized as a slave-free territory. Um, slavery was banned in Oregon. Now exhausted uh, and really just, you know, not even someone uh, that the party wanted to run again, Polk announced that he wouldn't be seeking a, a second term and thusly his proposal was sidelined. Now the Mexican session divided the Democratic Party bitterly. Uh, Louis Cass received the party's nomination but alarmed Northern Democrats uh, wanted the inclusion of the Wilmot Proviso and in June of uh, 1848 a group of anti-Northern Democrats met in Utica, New York and organized a splinter party based around the assertion that Congress had full authority to ban slavery in the territories. And two months later, they rebranded they re themselves the Free Soil Party in Buffalo, New York, with men like Frederick Douglass and David Wilmot attending as delegates. Now, in a, in a uh, repudiation, uh, in a uh, deliberate repudiation of the Democratic Party, the Free Soil Party party nominated Martin Van Buren, uh, former president and former vice president Martin Van Buren, as their candidate 
uh, for the election of uh, 1848 and used the political slogan, free soil, free speech, free labor, free men. Uh, the split off of the uh, free soiler from the Democratic Party elevated the slavery issue from a moral argument to a sectional political issue capable of wrecking sturdy political institutions. Remember, uh, the Jacksonian Party at this point has stood for more than 20 years. It was nearing 30 years. Um, the Jacksonian Party has stood for so long uh, and now slavery had inflicted a, a major wound, a festering, slavery had been a festering wound for them and now it had become an issue that caused a major split off in the party. And with that, we'll break our lecture on the aftermath of the uh, Mexican War and we'll come back uh, with another lecture. Um, as always, I'm Ted. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, hit like, subscribe, and comment. And let me know what you thought about the, the early um, effects of the aftermath of the Mexican War.